Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone back. I do want to continue to remember all those in our prayers, especially David at this time. He's dealing with his blood pressure issues. I pray that he'll be back soon with us. This afternoon, I'm going to totally switch gears from what we did this morning. And it's something that we don't really talk about a whole lot. You hear an occasional sermon about it, not too often. But it's a subject of capital punishment. Seems to be in the news a lot from time to time. And varying opinions on it. You have a lot of people that will give you their opinion on it, whether right or wrong. And we hear so much about it, and some people become confused and want to know as Christians... What view should we take or how should we look at this? Because we know that Texas is one of the leading states for capital punishment. And I, when I first moved here, I heard, you kill somebody, we'll kill you. Not individually, but the government, the state. There are some states who have banned or outlawed capital punishment. There are some states that still have it, but they don't practice it, or if they do, it's on a rare occasion. Our prisons are filling up with those who have committed some very heinous crimes and taxpayers continue to foot the bill for them to stay in there for some time the rest of their lives. So what kind of view should we have when it comes to capital punishment? I mean, should it be acceptable in a civilian or civilized society? Some have asked the question, is it morally right for government to administer capital punishment? Others have asked what the purpose is behind capital punishment and what does it really accomplish? And we have to ask ourselves a question, how do we find these answers? We can turn to various sources, receive conflicting answers. You can turn to uh, news media and receive mostly the same answer. A lot of those don't believe in it. Then you'll have some who do. But how do we look at it? For Christians, we have to go back to the standard that I talked about this morning. Since we know that doctrine is important, the Bible's teaching is important, we have to go back to that. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So we understand from that passage that God's Word is complete and God's Word gives us the answers. So in this study, we're going to endeavor to look at the Bible, to see what the Bible has to say about this subject. We're going to look both in the Old and the New Testament and discuss this. So let's go back to the book of Genesis. We're going to start in the book of Genesis since that is the book of beginnings. And we're going to look at some things about capital punishment in the very beginning. Before the flood, we know that Cain had killed his brother Abel. Did God immediately put Cain to death? No, he didn't. As a matter of fact, we're going to read in this passage that he received some sort of protection from God against capital punishment at this point. In Genesis 4, 13 through 15, we can read, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on, in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So God did not enact capital punishment on Cain. Does that mean then that God does not approve of capital punishment at all? Well, we'll go further, and then we'll notice that. Lamech, a descendant of Cain, presumed even more protection against capital punishment after killing a young man in Genesis chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. We're not going to read that passage. You can read that later. It's Genesis 4, 23 and 24. By the time that Noah had come along, the mention that corruption and violence had so filled the earth 
that God decided because of the wholesale corruption and violence that he is going to destroy all who lived upon this earth. When you consider that a form of capital punishment, I think that would be the ultimate capital punishment. He wiped everybody out except Noah and his family. And if you go to Genesis chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, And the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Verse 13, Then God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. It had become so violent and so corrupt that God said, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. And God caused the great flood to come, and it destroyed everyone living here, save those eight souls who were in the ark. Well, what about after the flood? Immediately after the flood, man is given an awesome responsibility. If you look in Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, we find Moses writing this by inspiration from God. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. At the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of men. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Look at verse 6. It's very interesting. This is a verse where God enacts capital punishment. When he said, Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. Why would God do such a thing? Why would God approve of put into death someone who had killed another human being. He says it the very last phrase of that verse. For in the image of God made he man. God made man with a soul. And because man has a soul, and a person takes the life of a person, another person, doesn't take the soul from them, but because that person created an image of God with that soul in him, God said, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. There's a verse for capital punishment. Some argue well, that's the Old Testament. It is the Old Testament. We're going to get to that in a minute. But it was given as a general principle that God has never changed. The reason God wanted man to take care of this because, as I mentioned earlier, that man was created in the image of God. Now, we see the beginning of capital punishment. I want to go a little bit further and look at capital punishment from the Old Testament. God gave the law to govern the nation of Israel. And that law was both civil and religious in nature and has served as a basis for criminal justice and many other civilizations since first given by God. If you go back and look at, at what we're going to notice today, and I'm not going to go through all of this, we're actually not going to look at these verses. I'm going to tell you where God enacted it. Take you a pen and paper and write this down. It'll be worthwhile to look at later, to go through verse by verse. There's just far too many verses to go through and read to have enough time to cover this. But God, because he made the Old Testament law both civil and religious law, then he had a judge and govern based on how man operated in civil law as well as the Israelites under religious law, ultimately the law of Moses. But in this, if you go to Exodus chapter 21, we find capital punishment prescribed for the following crimes. And folks, we don't even practice capital punishment on most of these. But this is what God enacted for capital punishment under the old law. In Exodus 21, 12 through 14, premeditated murder. We do that as well. Exodus 21, 15, it was a capital crime to abuse one's parents. In Exodus 21, 16, kidnapping was considered a capital offense. 
Just imagine that now. We have a lot of people being kidnapped. Maybe if we started putting kidnappers to death, it would slow down. or It probably wouldn't completely stop it, but it would greatly reduce the kidnappings we see. Folks, here's another one. And I heard this growing up, and some of you may have too. Cursing your parents. Exodus 21, 17. Disobeying your parents. If you disobeyed your parents, you could be put to death. Striking the expecting mother, which caused the child to be born prematurely and die. Exodus 21, 22 through 25. Capital offense. Someone will be put to death for causing the death of an unborn child or a prematurely born child by injuring the mother. Failing to keep a killer animal from killing. Exodus 21, 28, and 29. If you know you had a vicious, vicious animal and your animal killed someone, then you had to pay with your life. That's the way it was under the Old Testament. In Exodus 22, verses 2 and 3, it tells us that killing a thief in revenge was a capital punishment. Exodus 22, 18 also tells us that sorcery was a capital offense. In Exodus 22, 19, bestiality was also a capital offense. In Leviticus 20, verse 10, adultery was a capital offense. Well, we'd have a lot fewer people on this earth today if that was the case, if it still was practice. In Leviticus 20, verses 11 and 12, incest was considered a capital offense. And Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, homosexuality was considered a capital offense. A person was put to death for being homosexual. Nowadays, if you even say it's wrong, then uh, the other side wants to kill you. By the way, and we're going to go into this a little bit more, but on a little side note, I find it interesting that the nation particularly we live in, the world in general, you have some of these liberals that are against capital murder, and don't believe we should practice capital murder in any form unless you disagree with them. And then they believe you ought to be put to death. They don't think the government ought to put someone to death, except abortion, of course, and then they're all for that. Just, mind of a liberal is amazing, amazingly ignorant. But anyway, when we see these things happening and the way this world's going today, you look at all the rights we've had in the last few years, protecting one group against another group, and the one group that says it's wrong to do anything to the other group wants to kill the ones that disagree with them. Have you ever thought about how foolish their thinking is, how warped, in some sense, in some sense and instances, mentally, their thinking is, or the lack of it? Some of them have mental issues. When you get that kind of thinking that it's wrong for capital punishment, but you turn around and say, yeah, but we need to kill this person because I don't agree with them or I don't like them or we need to beat this person or we need to do this, particularly with the homosexuality movement or homosexual movement, the LGB, QRS, TUV, whatever they want to call it all. You can't even keep up with it all now. You can't even say anything against them. People are losing their jobs if they stand up for their religious rights which the Constitution guarantees us religious freedom until you disagree with one of them. The Constitution still guarantees it. But then the liberals want to stone you to death, shoot you, or do something. They believe in capital punishment, just not in a logical sense in the way that it should be carried out. Okay, now let's go further. Leviticus 20.14, a capital offense was if a person married both a mother and a daughter. That's a capital offense. Being a medium or spiritist, a sorcerer, witchcraft, things like that, capital offense, Leviticus 20, 27. And then breaking the Sabbath, Numbers 15, 32 through 36 was a capital offense. Maybe it's a good thing that we don't have some of these capital offenses today under the new law. Because that, like I said, there'd be a lot fewer people here on this earth. But was the law a good law? In Romans chapter 7 and verse 12, Paul wrote to the Romans, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, just, and good. Yes, it was a good law. For the people of that day, it was a good law. 
And while the religious aspects of the law were temporary, Galatians 3, 23 through 25, the civil law serves its purpose very well to govern and preserve a nation. And that's why God enacted the law in the way he did under the law of Moses. That old law was to govern uh, this, the nation of Israel and to keep them in check. It was everything for them. Civil and religious law all wrapped up into one. But now let's change a little bit. What about capital punishment of the New Testament? Well, unlike the Old Testament, the purpose of the New Testament is somewhat different. It's not designed to govern and regulate civil governments and the way we think today. Now, we do have a section we're going to get in that does regulate it. But as a whole, the New Testament is designed for those in Christ's kingdom, which is spiritual in nature, John 18, 36. His purpose is to help mankind achieve and maintain a right relationship with God. And for the most part, it does not govern itself in telling men of the world how to regulate their civil affairs. For the most part, it does give us some, but it doesn't go into specifics as it did in the Old Testament. But in defining our relationship to civil authorities, while a subject, we're subject to a higher power and a higher law, there's references that God has given us to understand his attitude toward capital punishment in the New Testament. Let's look at Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, we're going to look at verses 1 through 7, and I'm going to read that because we do need to spend some time on it. Let every soul be subject unto the higher power, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do thou which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Now notice verse 4, and this is going to get into the meat of it. For he is the minister of God. Who is? Civil government. For good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Notice how this is laid out and Paul teaches the Romans this particular lesson. Again, this, as we talked about this morning, inspired of God, is doctrine and must be followed. And we obey the laws or should obey the laws of our civil government, not for fear of what might happen to us, but for our conscience sake. We should want to obey the laws of the land. Most of us do. That's why we're here today and not behind bars somewhere. There are people that are behind bars now and will be for a long time, some for the rest of their lives, because of some of the crimes they have committed. But when we do that which is good, we don't have to be afraid. You know, I know my job as a police officer, and I'm in my patrol vehicle a lot, and it does get a little frustrating. I will say I'm driving down the road, and somebody sees, oh, there's the popo, and they all slam on the brakes. They're running 55, they still slam on the brakes. Don't be afraid, I'm not going to get you. You're doing the speed limit. They do less than the speed limit and impede traffic, they may get pulled over and given a ticket for impeding traffic. But when you do the speed limit, don't get scared. I've heard people say, oh, I just get so nervous, I see a police officer behind me. If you're not breaking the law, why are you worried? We don't just pull people over randomly because, hey, I, I think I'll pull that car over. I don't know why, but I'll pull them over for something. We have to have a reasonable suspicion that a crime has been or is in the process of being committed or may be committed based on the totality of some circumstances that we might have, some of its pre-existing knowledge we may have about a particular vehicle. Otherwise, we're not going to pull you over. Keep on driving. Drive the speed limit. 
But people get all nervous. If you do good, don't worry about it. You're doing good. You'll receive praise of the same. I have praised people before for doing right. And then I fussed at them when they do wrong. But folks, we do what is right and we don't have to worry about it. And that's what he's saying in Romans 13. But he said, if you do evil, be afraid, very afraid. Because you have a revenger who's going to execute wrath upon all those who do evil. Who's the revenger? The civil government. That's why we have court systems, judges. See, when I catch somebody doing wrong, I put them in handcuffs if it's an arrestable offense, I'm going to take them to jail. I ain't going to say that's the end of it for me because I may have to go to court. But as far as what I do, that's what I do. I at least have enough probable cause that warrants them going in handcuffs in the back of a patrol car, taken to a jail, and put in that jail for them to take care of them behind some bars. Then it's up to the court system, our judges, to determine you either did something wrong or you didn't do something wrong. If you did something wrong, let's see how much punishment you're going to receive. Should you receive a lot of punishment or a little punishment? Depends on what they do. They execute the judgment for the government. Sometimes it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court who has the final say. And the Supreme Court will give that final say on a ruling on these cases that go to them. Many times, sometimes they kick it back to a lower court and let a lower federal court take care of it. But it's all through these court systems. That's our civil government. They are the revenger to execute wrath upon those who do evil. So as we go further, look at what Paul said in Acts chapter 25, verse 11. Paul even realized that he was not above it. Because when the government fulfills its responsibility on those who are evil, it does not bear the sword in vain. Notice, does not bear the sword in vain. The sword is an instrument of war. It is a weapon to use to strike someone down. And they don't bear it in vain. It's a clear allusion to the administration of capital punishment. So here's God's law of capital punishment in the New Testament. And thus the New Testament supports the government's right to exercise the death penalty. And what did Paul say in Acts 25 verse 11? For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof they accuse me, no man shall deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. When Paul was having to defend himself for preaching the gospel, his crime was that he was preaching Jesus Christ. And some people didn't want to hear it. And he said, but if I have done anything worthy of death, I'm not going to refuse to die. Put me to death. Paul even recognized capital punishment. And by that, implicitly upholds it. But he said, if I haven't, then you're not going to do this. I'm going to appeal to Caesar before you go any further. In other words, he's going to go to the highest person in the land and plead his case. Let's look at some common objections now to capital punishment. And then we're going to give some answers to those. Some people will say, the, well, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. This is very true. The Bible does say thou shalt not kill. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, part of the Ten Commandments, the word kill, not only in the Hebrew, but when you go to the New Testament where it says thou shalt not kill, means murder. That Hebrew word and the corresponding Greek word in the New Testament doesn't mean killing in general. It means to murder someone. And we understand what murder is. I mean, our laws are pretty clear on someone that commits murder. It forbids killing with malice and premeditation. In Exodus 21, God prescribes a death penalty for those crimes that we listed earlier. Those were... Crimes of the heart, passion, premeditation. Crimes of violation of God's law that he had enacted and told him not to do. He was very specific in those nine things that 
he prescribed for capital punishment. The command not to murder is directed toward individuals. Someone would have to ignore the context and twist the scripture to apply the word kill to capital punishment where it says thou shalt not kill. It means thou shalt not murder. And some more modern translations actually translate it in that manner. Another question that some people have is they say, well, the Bible says that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 18.4, that's true. Or 18.32, excuse me. Ezekiel 18.32. But you have to look at the context. If you look at Ezekiel 18.4 to begin with, it says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the souls of the Father, so also the souls of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Notice in that passage, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. We're not going to bear the iniquity for other people. Certain sins makes one worthy of death. Again, staying in Ezekiel 18, verses 10 through 13, he said, If he beget a son, a son that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that doeth the like to any one of these things, and that doeth not to any of the, those duties, but hath eaten upon the mountains, and defiled his neighbor's wife, hath oppressed the poor and needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, and hath lifted up his eyes to the idols, and hath committed abomination, hath given forth upon usury, and hath taken increase. Shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. You ever seen the bleeding heart liberals arguments? Oh, you're killing a, a person. Why are you killing? You're saying it's wrong to kill and you're killing. Makes you just as bad as them. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible already told us in Genesis 9, 6 what to do. If you shed man's blood, then your blood's going to be shed. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And in verses 10 through 13 of this passage, he is very clear on the fact when the person has committed all these abominations, he shall surely die. But notice he said in that last phrase, his blood shall be upon him. Don't blame everybody else. Don't blame the government for putting someone to death. Blame the murderer who committed the heinous crime and the heinous act that got him there in the first place. It's all on him. It's interesting just in general in, in what I have to do I've arrested people before. They say, you're going to cost me my freedom. You're costing me my life. You're costing me everything I have. I say, no, I'm not. You just cost yourself that. You're the one that did it. Don't put the blame on me. And I'll tell them that. I don't mind telling them that. But people will blame everybody else. Although I have had some say, it's my fault. I, I deserve it. I know I shouldn't have done it. So you give both ends of the spectrum in dealing with people today. It depends on their attitude toward law and common sense in general as to whether they're going to blame everybody else for their actions or they're going to take responsibility for their own actions. Capital punishment is often said by some in an argument, well, it just doesn't work. It really doesn't deter crime. Well, it could be true to a certain extent because we've got to actually follow through with it in a timely manner. When capital punishment is not carried out fairly quickly, then you see what we see today. And I'm not saying take them from the trial to the gallows or the firing squad or to the death chamber for lethal injection. They've got their right to appeal. They've got a right to do that. But carrying it on or dragging it out for year after year after year. Ezekiel, or rather Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. In many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, if we drag out capital punishment for 15, 20, or 30 years, it doesn't have the effect upon a lot of people that it normally would. Because most people, when that crime happened, had forgotten about it. Well, there's just another one. They put him to death. He must have done something bad. Or they'll say, well, he killed so-and-so, or he did this, or she did this, and then they put him to death. And they say, oh, well, that's just somebody else we we'll have to deal with. Let's go on with life. I don't worry about it anymore. And, and then these criminals will continue to go out and commit murder because they don't think anything about it, and sometimes they don't even care. But if your justice was a little swifter than what it is in the United States, then it would have a better impact upon people's thinking. 
I mean, back in the old days, they'd take you from the pretty much your trial. You're guilty. Get the gallows ready and they'd hang them. That's just the way they did it back then. It made people think. You go over to other countries, your thief will have his hands cut off, or at least a hand cut off, so they won't steal anymore. At least make them think twice about stealing again because they only got one left. You steal again, well, you ain't going to have any. How are you going to operate then? They can figure it out, but it ain't going to be too pleasant. A lot of other countries will have a swifter criminal justice system to where they don't have to deal with it as much. The crimes are far fewer because of it. It does work, but it would be more effective if we had a better system that demanded punishment for the crime, that fit the crime, and in a swifter manner. Then another argument, the final argument, some people say, well, innocent people are sometimes put to death. I'm not going to argue with that. There have been instances where innocent people have been put to death. But this is an argument that pertains to the criminal justice system in which capital punishment is ministered. It's not an argument against the ideal of capital punishment itself. It just means the government needs to do a better job in making sure a person is guilty before they put that person to death. If they don't have conclusive evidence, then they should not be put to death. If someone points a finger at them, they say, well, I saw them. You know how many people have told lies because they got mad at somebody or because that's, they want justice for something, and they just picked a person out. Oh, I saw that person. It might be the person, then again, it might not. So it's going to happen. We just need a little bit better system on that as well. In the Old Testament, capital punishment could not be applied unless a crime was seen by two or more witnesses. Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. And it was at the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word could be established. So again, we don't have a perfect system in our country, but we've got a system that is still working for the most part. And it's something that the laws of most countries have been based on some of the very verses that we've looked at today. And they understand there is a need to punish those who kill other people. So does God approve of capital punishment? We've seen in this lesson this, this afternoon that God gave mankind the responsibility to carry it out after the flood. And his own illustration of justice in the government he gave to Israel shows that he approved of it. Not only did he approve of it, he gave the commands on those nine particular instances. He said capital punishment would be applied. Certainly any civilized nation abhors violence and bloodshed. We all should. But civilizations cannot exist with violence and corruption running rampant. And it cannot exist when the government fails to administer judgment and justice with the punishment that fits the crime. But how does God view governments that fail to carry out their responsibilities? Isaiah 5, verses 20 through 23, as with anything, it takes away the justice of those who deserve to have justice for a family member or someone killed who was innocent in what they were doing. And as with anyone who fails to fulfill their only responsibility, according to Jeremiah 48 and verse 10, they're going to receive a cursing from God. Many may refuse to accept what the Bible teaches about capital punishment, but those of us who as Christians who accept the Bible and accept the inspired word of God and the inspired writings acknowledge that capital punishment is ordained of God. We may have a personal belief that we're not comfortable with it, but folks, the Bible teaches it's true and it's to be done. We follow the Bible. Like I said when I started this lesson, this is a little bit different. We don't hear a lot of lessons on this. We don't talk about it a lot except for in social settings when... We hear Texas is about to execute another one or Texas just ex executed another one or some other state randomly. And we might have conversations about it. But this is something that we need to think about and I hope this lesson has been beneficial to help all of us see what the Bible teaching, Bible's teaching is on this particular subject and help us to appreciate more what God has done for us and why God's done things for us. Because he's done these things to keep us safe. We don't live in a safe world. And it's never going to be totally safe. But God has given measures and put measures in place so that we can somewhat live peaceably here upon this earth as much as possible. And when governments do their job in enacting these laws 
and in not only enacting them but following through with the punishment phase of these laws, then it does create a safer environment for all of us to live and for our families to live without the fear of someone trying to kill us or harm us in some way at every turn we make and every step we take. As we close this lesson, as a child of God, if you're not living a Christian life and doing so faithfully, then you can come back and ask God to forgive you. Make changes necessary in repentance, confession, and prayer. If you're not a Christian, you can obey Jesus Christ through having faith in Him, changing in repentance, confessing His name, and being buried in baptism, where you'll reach the blood of Christ and be added to His church. And as you live a faithful Christian life, heaven will be yours one day. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing?